The story you are about to hear is true. Attention, all true. He's alive. Around the turn of the 1970s to the 1980s, we had a major death in my family. At that point, outside of my immediate extended family, I didn't have a ton of outside friends. I had just made three close friends a couple of months before this death, and I was still learning my relationship with them and how close I would become to them. This was around Christmas time, and, you know, when you have a death, people get very upset, and at times I was inconsolable. My mother would encourage me to get out of the house go outside and play, she would say. Didn't really feel like it, but of course when you're feeling that gloomy, nothing really makes you feel all that better, and especially sledding down hills and having snowball fights just doesn't have much appeal. Well, one of my friends had an Atari, and I'd gone over to call to see if he would come out, and he said, no, you gotta come in and play this new game I have. The game he got was called Adventure. Now, this was before I got to play Dungeons and Dragons with people and would discover the rich world of fantasy that lay before me. I watched him play and was fascinated. This was something I had never seen before. Basically, you took the form of an adventurer and went through a castle, and it was remarkable. You picked up objects, you dodged dragons. I couldn't wait to play. And I probably waited about two and a half hours before my friend let me play. Very worth it. I went home, and I think I was visibly a little less shaken than I had been. And so my mother asked me, what did you do today? And I said, oh, it was this game that I played on the Atari, and there were dragons and all sorts of stuff. And she said, well, what was the game called? I said, it's called Adventure. The very next day, I had a copy of Adventure of my very own. It was a very good day. And of course, it helped me get through some tough times. To this day, when I fire up Adventure, I find it oddly reassuring, and not just in the comfortable, nostalgic way that an Atari game can make you feel, but it gave me very specific comfort at a time when I really needed it. And games can do that, even now. So I'm sure that many of you have gone through some hard times and you've picked up some game and it's very special to you. I'm going to talk about the game that was very helpful to me. On today's show, we're going to talk about Adventure. We'll talk about its development, of course, its developer, its precursor. We'll talk about the gameplay, the characters in the game, how well it did, its ports and sequels, and of course, we'll throw in surprises here and there. We have an info-packed episode ahead of us, so without further ado, let's start the show. When I say adventure to the average person who grew up in the 70s and 80s, they will probably jump to the Atari 2600 version. But if you were on a computer before you had an Atari 2600, you could be thinking of another adventure, a text adventure, which is actually the basis for the adventure game that we're going to talk about. And that adventure is sometimes called the Colossal Cave Adventure. If you're looking it up and want information about it, that's probably the best way to find it. It also had other names like Advent, Colossal Cave, but many people knew it as an adventure. And it is the first computer adventure game, and it was originally designed by Will Crowther, who was a programmer and caving enthusiast, who was working on developing something called ARPANET, and ARPANET is the forerunner of today's internet. And he had some time on his hand, and he wanted to create a game that he could enjoy with his daughters. Now, being an experienced caver, he was very familiar with the Mammoth Cave System in Kentucky, and he used that as the basis the game and designing this game and if you're not familiar with text games 
they're those games where you type in a command and you actually just see it on the screen. Now, having just a cave exploration game sounds okay, but what made it really special is that there were some fantasy elements added to it. Magic and dwarves. Now, the game that everybody really came to know was actually an expanded version of that game. The game was found on a computer out in Stanford by a graduate student named Don Woods, and he received Crowther's blessing to build upon the game, and he added more fantasy elements, which made the game even more likable. The game is very important in the history of gaming. As I said, it was one of the first computer adventure game, and in addition to inspiring the making of Adventure for the Atari 2600, it would also inspire people like Ken and Roberta Williams, who would go on to found Sierra Online, which would later become Sierra Entertainment, and they were the creators of the first graphical adventure game, Mystery House, and they would go on to become a power player in the early software market, creating games like Space Quest, Leisure Suit Larry, and probably their most famous game, King's Quest. So we won't talk about adventure without first talking about its creator, Warren Robinette. Warren Robinette was a young programmer who was working at Atari in the early days during the 2600. And he had worked on two other very important games over at Atari. Well, I say games, but one game, Slot Racers, and the other which was the basic programming cart, which was a remarkable piece of technology for the time, given the limitations of the 2600. After creating Adventure and Slot Racer and Basic Programming, he would leave Atari and became chief software engineer and a co-founder at the Learning Company in 1980, and there he created Rocky's Boots in 1982. That was one of the first successful educational games that taught a generation how to use Boolean logic using puzzles. Where have all the Boolean puzzle games gone? So Robinette obviously was inspired by the adventure game written by Don Woods and Crowther. He got the idea while he was working on the slot racers game for the Atari and thought to himself, how can I do a text adventure game that uses verbal commands like go north, take wand, and use just a joystick and a button? So his idea was I'll make the joystick obviously go north, south, east, west, just as if you type those in, and the button would be for picking up and dropping objects. Worked really well. And of course, instead of in describing how each area looked, he could just display it on the screen. This seems so basic now, but at the time, this was groundbreaking. People were not doing this sort of thing. So to even make that leap was a major achievement. He started out with just the idea for the man in the game. And the man is that little cursor, the square. And after he had that and could move it around, he also created the dragons that chased you around the screen. And this is what he had as his proof of concept. And it was a pretty cool thing, but it wasn't a game in any way. So there had to be a way of countering those dragons who were trying to eat you. So he added another element, a sword, and the sword could kill dragons. And if you didn't guess, that would be the text equivalent of some command, like kill dragon. Pretty straightforward. Then as the game went on, he thought he would add another element which was the bat, and the bat would add this sort of unpredictability to the game by stealing whatever item you were carrying. The Atari 2600 had constraints, so there was this real challenge of having to make mirror copies of what was on one side of the screen and the other, which in itself makes my brain hurt just trying to figure it out. To aid in moving around and overcoming obstacles that might come up, the bridge was created, and the bridge allows you to move across walls in the maze. Because of the layout, sometimes the key would get dropped inside a wall, and you would be unable to pick it up. So to deal with that bug, another object was added, the magnet. And that would be the last object in the game, besides the object that allows you to unlock something called an Easter egg. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. The magnet was a clever solution because if something got stuck in the wall, you go get the magnet, pull it right out, it's yours again. Pretty easy. Originally, a bird was supposed to be in the game, sort of a running bird, but Robinette really couldn't find a use for him. So rather than leave something in the game that had no function just because it might be cool, he removed it from the game. (laughs) 
Robinette worked on the game despite the fact that his boss at the time, George Simcox, said that he didn't think with the Atari 2600 resources that anything could be accomplished. He worked on the game starting in May of 78, and he worked like crazy on it for a month. That's when he had come up with that prototype that allowed you to move from screen to screen and having the dragons chasing you, which is pretty awesome, but it was pretty tiring to do. So he took a month off to sort of get his energy back. And when he came back, marketing and other people had seen it, thought it was impressive, but they didn't really see a game there. At the same time, the company that owned Atari, Warner, was releasing a movie called Superman. And they asked him to change adventure into Superman so that they could cash in on the hype. Of course, he did not want to do that. He had this idea and really wanted to see it through, so he kept trying to stall. Luckily, after a few weeks of this, a co-worker named John Dunn volunteered to take the existing code for adventure and turn it into a Superman game. And this allowed Robinette to work exclusively on the adventure game. By the fall of 78, the game was almost done, but Robinette wasn't satisfied with it. So he put it on the shelf and began working on the basic programming cartridge that I mentioned, and then slowly started to work on both of them and finished both of them in June of 79. At that point, he was exhausted, burned out, and had $10,000 in his bank account. And for a young guy in the 70s, that's pretty impressive. So he decided to quit Atari and go backpacking in Europe. So by the time Adventure came out, Robinette wasn't even with the company anymore. Now, why do we know Robinette's name? Well, besides the fact that he created a really great game, he also did something that nobody had ever done before. He added his own name to Adventure. See, each game for the Atari 2600 was designed entirely by one person. But in the game, there was no place that said who that person was. So you weren't getting the credit for all this great work you did. So Robinette had this idea. He would hide his signature in the game. Now, in a game like Adventure, it's perfect because it has these multiple rooms and you could easily hide secret things, but there's always the risk that Atari would discover it, and then what? Well, the first person that Robinette heard discovered it was a 15-year-old kid from Salt Lake City who wrote a letter to Atari explaining exactly how he found the secret room and asking for Atari's comments. Now, when this happened, Robinette expected that they would go in and change the ROM to expunge that easter egg from any future versions of the game. But when you're making a new ROM, it costs 10 grand. And, well, 10 grand's 10 grand. And Atari decided, "Eh, we don't really need to take it out. So this became the first hidden surprise in a game and would become known as an easter egg. And easter eggs would become very popular in gaming as time moved forward. A little bit about how to get to the easter egg. Inside the Black Castle's catacombs, when you're playing on difficulty level 2 or 3, in the south wall of a sealed chamber only accessible with the bridge is a one-pixel object referred to as the gray dot. Now what you got to do is bounce the cursor along the bottom wall to grab the dot. And keep in mind this dot is not attracted to the magnet, so you don't want to lose it. If you bring this dot to the east end of the corridor below the Golden Castle, while other colored objects are present. This causes the wall object to become invisible, allowing the player to pass into a room displaying the words created by Warren Robinette. An amazing moment in gaming history. What is amazing now is just how complicated some things are in the creative process when it comes to gaming. So it's really interesting to read about two things about Adventure. One, how they got that name, which is so simple. Robinette had adapted the game from another game called Adventure. Don Woods, who created that original game, had put the game in the public domain, so they could completely use that name. Another thing that I liked is how non-secretive things were back then. You didn't have to sign NDAs or anything like that. Before the game ever got released, he actually would haul the game around, show it to friends, brought it home for Christmas before it was out. Nobody freaked out about that, and nobody got fired. Instead, a lot of people got a real treat being able to say, I played Adventure a year before it came out. Simpler times. 
We'll return after these messages. Okay, Atari, let's see your best pitch. Your outros! The Atari video computer system is 20 cartridges with 1,300 game variations you play on your own TV set. You can't keep me in here, Atari. tonight play it it's atari's video game defender i played on coleco vision activision i played on coleco vision mattel's m network and imagine we played them on coleco vision introducing coleco vision's first expansion module that lets you play all atari 2600 compatible cartridges and with all of coleco vision's cartridges that means you can play more games than any other video game system it's simple you can play atari 2600 cartridges on coleco vision but you can't play coleco vision on atari coleco vision the expandable video game home computer system How far is far? Announcing the Activision Decathlon by David Frey. How fast is fast? Ten events designed to challenge the limits of your ability. How great is great? I never thought I would experience the challenge of the Decathlon again. I was wrong. For your Atari 2600, the Activision Why? Decathlon, let the games begin. And now... Back to the show. So a little bit about gameplay. The goal in the game is to find the enchanted chalice and return it to the gold castle. The player, who is represented by a square or cursor, explores a multi-screen landscape that has castles and mazes, and hidden throughout these worlds are a sword, keys to unlock each of the three castles, and there are Three castles are black, white, and gold, a magic bridge, which allows you to travel through a wall, and a magnet, which will pull any of those objects towards you. The thing is, roaming that world are some enemies. Three dragons, and you can kill a dragon by touching it with a sword, but keep in mind, if a dragon touches the player, it will swallow him. Besides the dragons, and we'll talk a little bit about each of them in a little bit, there's also a black bat which flies around randomly and occasionally you'll be seen picking up or dropping objects including dragons so that bat adds that random element that makes the game engaging each time you play it there are three different games available via the game select switch game one is a simplified version of the game that does not have the red dragon the catacombs the white castle the maze inside the black castle, or the bat. Very easy. Game 2 is the full version with everything in it. It is also a mode in which you can find the Easter egg. Game 3 is just like Game 2, but all the objects in the game are randomized in a way. That makes Game 3 very weird to play, in that it can be easy or harder. If you are eaten by a dragon, you do not necessarily have to start over. If you hit the game reset switch, it resurrects the player at the gold castle and also resurrects any dragons killed. Which is kind of cool because all the objects that you had will remain where they were at the time of your death. And this is one of the earliest uses of basically a continue game feature on a home console. So just a little bit about the dragons. They might look like chickens, but they do have names. First there's Yorgul, the yellow dragon, who's afraid of the gold key and will run away from it. He's the guardian of the chalice when he can find it. Otherwise, he just sort of wanders around helping the other dragons guard their possessions. The green dragon is Grundle, and he guards the magnet, the bridge, the chalice, and the black key. And Rindle is the red dragon. He's the fastest of the three and the most aggressive. He'll guard the white key and the chalice. Everybody guards the chalice when they can. The bat's name in the game is never revealed, but it was intended to be Nubberub. That never made it into the game or the manual, but it has been revealed in retrospect. The game technical overview. The total memory used in the game was a mere 496 bytes, 4K, for the game code in ROM, and 128 bytes for the program variables in RAM. And technical overview. Today's episode is brought to you by your local boat dealership. Get with- 
with it, get a boat. Get with it, get a boat. Get a boat and go, go, go. Have more fun on the H2O. Get with it, get a boat. 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 Love those boats. So Adventure was one of the best-selling Atari games, selling over a million copies. At 25 bucks a piece, that's not bad. Now there were six other games for the Atari 2600 that sold more copies. How many can you name? Go. <laughs> The six games in order from six to one are Atlantis, E.T. the Extraterrestrial, Demon Attack, Missile Command, Pitfall, and of course, Pac-Man. I think Pitfall should still be number one. So you got a great game like Adventure. It's bound to have some sequels and ports. I just want to tell you a little bit about Adventure 2, which is a homebrew game for the Atari 5200. It was made available through AtariAge.com. I've had the opportunity to play it, and it is a really cool expansion on the original Adventure concept. If you're a fan of Adventure, check it out. I think you'll get a kick out of it. Adventure has been ported to many modern consoles like the Xbox and PlayStation 2. It has been included on the Atari Flashback 1 and 2. It came out in a collection for Windows and in the game room for the Xbox Live Arcade. It has also been ported to iOS in 2011 and was made available on the iPhone, iPad, and iPod Touch. Matt talked about these ports and the homebrew sequel. They had originally hoped to create an adventure sequel at Atari and announced one in early 1982. That sequel never happened officially through Atari, but evolved instead to become the Sword Quest series of games. Robinette said that he has, had many times in the past, thought about a sequel to Adventure, and games he has worked on started out as a sequel, but never ended as one. We'll return after these messages. Ms. Pac-Man, Vanguard, and Galaxian. If you thought it was going to be just another summer, Atari is going to turn your head around. The hot names, the hot games, the hot deals. Yeah, it's gonna be a whole bunch, cause nobody's hotter than Atari this summer. Nobody's hotter than Atari this summer. Yeah. This is the Nintendo video game system. It plays about 80 games. This is the new Atari XE system. It plays hundreds of games. And only Atari comes with a real joystick and missile command. Both have guns, but only Atari comes with the target game, Bug Hunt. Nintendo has a toy robot, but only Atari gives you a keyboard for playing advanced computer games. It even comes with the amazing Flight Simulator 2 cartridge. The new Atari XE video game system. Unbeatable. And now, back to the show. Adventure has been parodied on TV shows like Robot Chicken and in the web series Homestar Runner. And usually when it is parodied, it's because of those wonderful dragons that people love to make fun of. Adventure introduced 
wonderful concepts to the world of gaming. Objects that could be picked up and moved from place to place. Continue feature, a graphically centered multi-screen game world. It was the first action-adventure game and would inspire an entire genre of video games to come, including games like Legend of Zelda and Ultima. In addition, it also launched the Easter egg craze, which for better or for worse has been a central part of video game making for decades now. On a personal level, it is one of my favorite games and helped me through some difficult times, and for that I'm very grateful. Thanks for listening to the show. For more retro fun, drop by the website at www.retroist.com. You can follow me on Facebook and Twitter. I'm at twitter.com slash retroist and facebook.com slash retroist.com. If you like the music in the show, that music is by Peachy. If you have musical needs, why not email peachy at peachy at retroist.com. Thanks for listening to the show, and I hope you have a great weekend. So when I say adventure, oh, that was loud. So this has been a retrospective production. Goodbye.